Hello everyone, my name is Bruce Pingleton and I'm Dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication at Washington State University. Welcome to our town hall event with President Kirk Schultz and Provost Elizabeth Chilton. Uh, as you know, Kirk is the 11th president of Washington State University. He and Noel joined WSU in 2016 and they are tenured professors in the Boylan College of Engineering. He previously served as president at Kansas State University for seven years. And at Washington State University, he is busy guiding us to a position as a top public research institution with his Drive to 25. As I mentioned in an earlier meeting with Kirk, there are a few things I truly appreciate about he and Noel. Um, one is their strong public presence and public support of Washington State University and the Murrow College in particular. Uh, and Kirk also is uh, the most transparent president Washington State University has had in my time here and I appreciate that. It makes my job easy, easier as a dean and easier on our faculty as well. Uh, Elizabeth Chilton joined Washington State University in July and um, she started during a pandemic and now in the middle of wildfires. So um, something like living on the edge of a volcano or, uh, or hell or something like that. Uh, but I really uh, am genuinely appreciative of her uh, coming to Washington State University. Oh. So I have actually like... not met Elizabeth Bailey. She served as, I'm sorry? We Most lost you for a bit. Okay. Am I back? Okay. Um, well, Elizabeth started her career at Harvard. Did we get that in? Okay, awesome. Most recently, she was dean of the Harper College uh, at the uh, Binghamton University, which is one of the largest uh, programs in uh, the SUNY system. Uh, one of the things I appreciate about Elizabeth is if you look at her career, she has made it a permission to create universities that are more accessible, diverse, and inclusive. And before we experience another glitch, I'm going to turn it over to Kirk so he can take it away. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Bruce, thanks for having us. If I can get that first slide put up, that'd be awesome. All right. Well, folks, thank you uh, for spending some time with us today. Uh, we look forward to talking through uh, some of the things that uh, accomplishments at the general university level, some accomplishments that uh, in the Murrow College, and then uh, really doing a quick financial update, having some time then to talk about some initiatives that are ongoing during this upcoming year. And we should have plenty of time for questions uh, and answers. And please use that chat function as we go through this and you have questions and things like that, that's the right place to pose them. We'll try and answer some of them in real time. Others of them, uh, we'll make sure we get to uh, at the end. Uh, but first is to our faculty and staff, hey, I just wanna express my appreciation for all the work that you're doing, your flexibility in this really difficult time. I know many of you are dealing with not just the pandemic, but issues around uh, systemic rape, racism and Black Lives Matters, wildfires. Uh, many of us, uh, many of you all have uh, probably also turning into K through 12 educators during this time. If you've got uh, children at home, daycare responsibilities. One of the other things that we're also uh, hearing more about is elder care and a lot of faculty having to deal with aging parents and things like that on top of all the rest of this. So we're gonna continue as a senior leadership team to suggest ways that we think we can help you all manage uh, a stressful work environment, help manage expectations from WSU uh, on the things that you all are working on. And if there are things that we can do to help, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. Uh, we can only uh, solve problems that we know are there and so just don't assume sometimes that we're aware of things that may be problematic or uh, areas we can help. So today to get ready for this, I made sure I put on my Murrow College pen uh, and ready to go and uh, look forward to really a productive time today. So next slide, please. Washington State University acknowledges that its location statewide are in the homelands of native peoples who have lived in this region from time immemorial. The university expresses its deepest respect for and gratitude to these original caretakers of the region. As an academic community, we acknowledge our responsibility to establish and maintain relationships with the native peoples in support of tribal sovereignty 
in the inclusion of their voices in teaching, research, and programming. We also pledge that these relationships will consist of mutual trust, respect, and reciprocity. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce to you uh, our new provost and executive vice president uh, who took a job in Washington State uh, without ever having been in the state. So uh, Elizabeth, take it away. Thank you, Kirk. Um, well, I, you know, certainly I had not come out to meet everyone who I would be working with. I had been in the state of Washington before, but I had not been on the any of the campuses of WSU, and I'm looking forward to the time where I can do that in person. So I'm really happy to be joining you uh, today. Um, and although, of course, I do wish it was in person, and I look forward to the time where I can meet more of you in person. I have not even met your dean. Uh, yet in person, just through Zoom, uh, although I've been his, impressed with his leadership um, so far in, in our interactions. So yes, I began my, my position as Provost and Executive Vice President on July 15th, and I moved to Pullman from upstate New York in late June with my son, who is a rising college sophomore, and my husband, who like myself, oh, uh, is a uh, professor of anthropology, and our two very loud dogs. I hope that the two fuzzy ones in the middle photo will not make themselves known during this presentation today, but they may. Um, and um, my research specialization is the archeology span of Northeastern North America, particularly Native American history, ecology, and subsistence prior to European colonization. It's very difficult for me to find a picture of me in the field where my head is not down in a hole. And so um, that one is, is quite ancient, that picture. It's, it's one of the few where you can actually tell that it's me. Um, so after spending five years at Harvard University post PhD, I then was uh, spent 15 years at UMass Amherst as a faculty member, department chair, center director, and lastly, the associate vice chancellor for research. I then served as Dean of Arts and Sciences, as, as Dean Pinkleton mentioned, uh, for three years <clears throat> before, before joining the Cougar community. So uh, tomorrow will mark nine weeks in my position. And of course, the day-to-day -day COVID response work takes up much of my time. Um, but some of the long-term issues I'm really excited to work on with all of you over the coming months. Uh, first of all, creating meaningful and productive um, system-wide partnerships. You know, the system, this issues or were something that um, was frequently discussed throughout my job interview process, throughout my onboarding, and nearly every day I'm discussing how we can continue to evolve and grow as a system um, and work out some of those early growing pains. We're a relatively young system, um, and I have experience in two other large public university systems, and so I'm, I'm really excited and interested in, in moving forward and in, in working on all of those with you. Second of all, I bring a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, Kirk and I will discuss a little bit more about how the Provost Office might be involved in some of those efforts moving forward. And finally, um, promoting a whole life philosophy for faculty and staff. Um, I have been impressed with how everyone was able to pivot very quickly and I think you all received the president's memo a week before last about um, being kind to ourselves and to one another. And that part of supporting equity and inclusion is just that, especially during um, extraordinarily uh, trying times. So thank you again for attending today's town hall and I look forward to the discussion. And I had to remember to unmute myself, otherwise I've been talking to my screen. Um, in previous uh, town halls, one of the things that we've done is this first part has been pretty data heavy. Uh, and this year, uh, because we're all suffering a little bit from Zoomitis, uh, what we wanted to do is maybe not be quite so data heavy. Um, when they weren't looking, I secretly did stick in a graph. And so uh, we'll have a little bit of data in this, but really want to focus on some institutional level achievements and things that were particularly proud of this up uh, for this last year. So uh, next slide. So completion of the first WSU system five year strategic plan. Uh, we spent really the last 18 months uh, formulating and putting together a, a system strategic plan. 
And now comes the hard part. Uh, we've got a plan. It's been a, it's been approved by the regents, and now it's implementation. And we'll talk a little bit about this near the end uh, of the presentation on initiatives this next year. But I appreciate the faculty that were engaged and involved, faculty and staff, in helping us put that together. Um, we've never had a separate Pullman plan and a separate uh, system plan. And I think this is an important step forward as we look to optimizing operations through the system while recognizing the need for each of our campus locations to uh, really make sure that they're doing what they need to in the community and for those students. We also launched this last year, a brand new center. Uh, and that's the Center for Research in Emerging Infectious Diseases in Nairobi, Kenya. And WSU has had a, a long-term uh, presence uh, in Africa and in Kenya. Uh, through our WSU Global Health Kenya program. Uh, this uh, center was founded with a $7.6 million grant from the National Institute of Health, and it's going to be led by Karayuki Jenga, uh, who is WSU's newest member of the National Academy of Medicine, and I think he was announced maybe in 2018 around that time frame. But it's neat to see us not do stuff just locally or regionally, but talk about a global presence for WSU uh, really an exciting opportunity there. Creation of a new department of viticulture and enology. Uh, during our last fundraising campaign prior to my time as president, we built a state-of-the-art wine and science center uh, in Richland, Washington on the campus of WSU Tri-Cities. And if you've been down there, you've seen it's really a magnificent teaching and research facility. We went to UC Davis and asked them, hey, you've got the best wine science center in the United States. If you're going to do another one, what would you do? And that really helped formulate that. But what we hadn't done is taken that next step. And we've talked about being a land grant university and responding to needs in the state. Uh, the wine industry asked us to have a separate program around viticulture and enology. And so Dean Andre Wright and his colleagues working with Sandra uh, Haynes, our chancellor at WC Tri-Cities, uh, put together uh, this new department that was approved by the regents this summer and it's going to meet the needs of a growing and thriving industry in the state of Washington. Uh, we also uh, will have all of our v &E students now will be there in the Tri-Cities, and it doesn't make sense to be at other campuses when you've got that state-of-the-art location there. And just think about it, you can take classes in the morning and be right in the vineyards and working side-by-side uh, -side with industry in the afternoon. It really is the ideal location and a great degree program. Finally, the Transformative Change Institute, one of the things, one of our, all of our goals, right, is to take as students come into WSU at any of our campuses, we want to see them all graduate. And retention of those students is really an important thing and something we need to work on. Uh, this is managed and led out of the provost's office as a system-wide initiative. We have members of the Transformative Change Initiative at all of our physical campus locations. And we want to continue to make sure every student who enrolls at WSU, we give that opportunity for them to finish that degree program and leave with as little debt as possible, as well as that opportunity to take that next step in their life and their career. Next slide, please. Well, we have, uh, if we take all of our faculty accomplishments, we can never hope to put them on a single slide. So every year we want to just pull out a few institution-wide ones, and then Elizabeth will talk about some very specific achievements for the Murrow College. Uh, this year we had eight faculty elected to the Washington State Academy of Sciences. Uh, this slide in previous presentations read seven. Uh, I was getting my usual critique from Noel, and uh, she mentioned, Kirk, can you count? Uh, you listed eight names in the slide says seven. So we magically transform that and uh, want to recognize eight of our colleagues that were uh, elected this last year into the Academy, Washington Academy of Sciences. That's Tim Basler and the Paul Allen School for Global Animal Health, uh, Kelly Brayton in veterinary microbiology and pathology, uh, Laura Griner Hill, uh, who is our senior vice provost for faculty development affairs, is also a professor in human development in Connors. Uh, Alara McLean in sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences, Michael McDonald, McDonald, excuse me, in the College of Medicine, Sterling McPherson, also in the College of Medicine, Katrina Mealy, uh, who's the Associate Dean for Research and Professor in Veterinary Medicine, and finally, Chin Zhang, who's Professor and Director of the Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems in the College of Agriculture, Human, and Nature Resource, Natural Resource Sciences. 
Now, the Washington State Academy of Sciences has people from a variety of fields in it. And what we need and what my request today to all of you all is nominate deserving colleagues. You've got certainly faculty in Murro that should be recognized at this level. And we want to encourage you to, to nominate your colleagues when those time uh, comes, uh, that time comes forward. We also had three faculty named fellows of the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, and this includes Renee Hoeksel, Shelley Fritz, and Kakab Shoshone. They'll be elect, uh, inducted in late October of this year. And there's only 230 people inducted around the world into the uh, American Academy of Nursing this last year. So pleased to have three of our colleagues uh, in that way. And then finally, uh, Stephen Hines from the College of Ed Med uh, won fourth place in an international competition for some of the creative things he's doing in the classroom during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I think we're gonna see more of these awards. And I just wanna continue to say, I'm so impressed with the, what so many of you are doing in our classrooms to find creative ways to interact and engage with our students. Um, WSU faculty have pivoted in a remarkable way. Instead of you know kind of complaining about it, I, I've been watching people say, hey, uh, this may not be what I wanted to do in this particular format, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make the best of it and I'm gonna make a great experience for our students, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Here's that graph that I snuck in and congratulations to all of our faculty out there doing sponsored research. Uh, this last year, nearly 370 million uh, in sponsored research at WSU. And if you can look and see where we've come since uh, 2005, 2006, when we were a $200 million a year institution, we are knocking on the door for 400 million. Um, what's truly remarkable about, uh, about this is this doesn't take into account the number of faculty or anything. And this is really you all writing outstanding proposals, uh, pairing up across colleges, across universities, and being successful and competing and winning, and then doing a great job on that research and scholarly activity. So congratulations to all of you on, on another great year and great job. Next slide, please. Well, intercollegiate athletics is a front door to the university, and we had some really exciting uh, achievements this year. Uh, the first, and what's shown here, uh, is some of our women's soccer players who advanced to the College Cup, finished in the top four uh, in the country. And uh, I tend to be a soccer fan. It was really a fun ride uh, to watch this team come together uh, to compete and then to win three consecutive away matches against higher ranked opponents, uh, including a couple of them had not lost all year playing at home and, and to watch our team come together. What a fantastic thing. I got to know several of our women's soccer players as well. Uh, these were just exceptional young women, great in the classroom, <clears throat> great on the field, and you know they're just going to do well in life. Um, we also, and the smoke's getting to me, excuse me, uh, academic success. <clears throat> For the fifth straight semester, WSU student athletes had their highest cumulative GPA at 3.17, and for the first time in school history, all athletic teams averaged over a 3.0 GPA in the spring semester. Um, Pat Chun, <clears throat> when he was hired, talked specifically about that if you took care of things in the classroom, then they took care of things on the field. And that was the order that was in. Pat's hired coaches that have focused around uh, academics, and we're starting to see some real positive benefits of that. Then finally, uh, I know that uh, intercollegiate fundraising for athletics has been uh, a challenge and an issue uh, since I've been here. Again, Pat Chun and his team did a great job this year, uh, raised over $27 million uh, in cash and pledges, uh, smashing really the previous record fundraising, which was 15 million and almost doubling that this last year. Folks, we should have this sort of expectation year in and year out. Intercollegiate athletics at the Division I Power Five level should be raising somewhere between 25 and $30 million on an annual basis. And just really pleased to see this level of success. Uh, next slide, please. Well, one of the things that uh, really is a standout achievement uh, for uh, the Murrow College this last year was uh, this major gift uh, from uh, Bruce Admonson and Julie Parker uh, establishing an endowed deanship in the Murrow College and endowed directorship uh, in athletics. And I just wanna call out uh, Bruce and the great job he's doing leading this college. 
Uh, donors do not step up and make these sort of major investments. And I put it that way purposely. Uh, if they don't believe in the leadership, they don't believe in the direction, they don't believe in the quality of the graduates coming out and just the overall uh, energy around a particular area and a particular unit. The other thing this does is kind of breaks the ceiling for giving to the Murrow College. Uh, what we need now is other people to, to look at Bruce and Julie's example and say, hey, I wanna invest in endowed chairs and professorships in Murrow. Uh, I wanna do scholarships in Murrow. I wanna sponsor research and other types of things. And so it's not just this gift alone, it sets a high bar for other givers. And I think we're gonna to continue to see other major investments in Murrow uh, moving forward. But this is something I'm very proud of. And uh, I was fortunate enough to help participate and move the gift along. But this really goes to uh, Bruce and April uh, and your development team for just doing a fantastic job here. We also had $200 million contributed to COVID-19 student relief funding by generous Cougs all over the, the state and nation. And, and these dollars have been really important uh, for us to responding to very quick kinds of needs from our students. We've complemented and supplemented this with uh, dollars from uh, my discretionary funds and other things to do hotspots uh, for students at this time that are not in high internet connectivity areas for Chromebooks for people that maybe relied on those laboratory computers uh, and didn't have the necessary technology to be successful at home. So we're gonna contribute to seek uh, dollars for this and to distribute those quickly and efficiently uh, to make sure that faculty, staff and students have those resources. I wanna also point out here that if there are any faculty or staff that also have internet connectivity issues while working from home or hardware issues, make sure you reach out to Elizabeth's office directly uh, because these are intended for students and faculty and staff to make sure everybody has what they need to be successful uh, this semester. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth now to talk about a few achievements in the Murrow College. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So as I've begun to get to know the college, I've been impressed at the breadth of faculty research and, and graduate education. And um, obviously I'm at the beginning of my learning curve, but I did want to highlight just a few areas. Um, first of all, the many of you know this, but the Center for an Import Informed Public is a collaboration between UW and WSU that launched this past winter. And as COVID took its toll, Dean Pinkleton and others decided to move WSU CIP Town Hall and Misinformation Day to virtual events. And Murrow uh, faculty launched several new studies concerning misinformation, in particular uh, through social media and concerning COVID-19. Um, led by Murrow College's new Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies, Paul Bowles, the Murrow Minds Research Program is an online home for the research happening at Murrow College, showcasing research and industry leadership, along with Murrow's award-winning faculty and graduate students. Murrow College and our College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences recently established a PharmD communications program that allows students pursuing a doctorate of pharmacy degree to complete one of two communication master's degrees and certificate programs. Students can then build their communication expertise through master's programs in health communications and promotion or strategic communications. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd also like to highlight um, briefly two individuals with noteworthy recent achievements. Uh, first of all, Lisa Juananen uh, Jones, published two co-authored articles for the New York Times pertaining to the COVID pandemic. Lisa also worked with the Times to improve database reporting on COVID-19 in rural communities. Jessica Willoughby is the only communication faculty member selected to serve on the CDC's National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Committee to provide recommendations relevant to public health programs, policy and research on the prevention and, and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases. So thank you to both of you and congratulations. Next slide, please. 
Several virtual initiatives are also underway, um, including um, Murro is uh, connecting students and alumni via a series of career coaching sessions using Zoom. I understand that 30 WSU alumni volunteered to coach 68 Murrow College students over five days. It's really great to see such strong alumni engagement. The college also hosted a series of extracurricular virtual panels for students and alumni, including a panel of former first generation students now employed in the communications industry. A team of seven Murrow faculty members served as online education coaches who helped Murrow faculty pivot to online teaching. That's really great, um, especially because, you know, we're all helping each other, given that this, uh, this quick switch was something that none of us had ever experienced. Additionally, with the transition to online learning and restrictions on large gatherings, Murrow's student services and recruitment team made everything virtual with a weekly video series, Murrow Minutes Goes Virtual. Uh, and finally, with the help of the Murrow marketing team, Student Services revamped its online presence and established a virtual student services lobby on the Murrow College website. These are just a few of the college's virtual initiatives. We certainly appreciate the college's emphasis and innovation on virtual platforms during this exceptionally challenging time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kirk. I get to do the fun stuff, fiscal updates. So <clears throat> over the last several years, uh, we've talked about uh, kind of where we are. But before I show that, uh, my second graph, um, what I want to do is just give a little bit of context. So uh, one, there may be some frustration out there about how come we don't know more about the university budget and where we are going into the year and things like that. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure that we do is when we provide information, we want it to be solid and make sure that we really know where things are. And so the state of Washington does not look like that we'll have a special session of the legislature to deal with some of the pending fiscal issues at the state level uh, until it, at the earliest, if it occurs, would be after the November election. A lot of what I'm hearing now says there won't be a special session and we're gonna go right into that January full session of the legislature. So we don't know beyond what we've already done thus far, what some of the state types of things are. And I wanna also ensure that as soon as we have solid information about any of that, we will certainly let you know. Um, I also wanna remind everybody that uh, the rumor mill uh, kind of works over time in universities. It has every time uh, I've been there and people always hear stuff. Well, I heard from so-and-so this is gonna happen and so on. Please, if you ever hear, any things about fiscal decisions or things that have happened, please send something to me directly, send it to Bruce, um, work through the faculty senate or uh, the um, staff, uh, our professional staff association to get those questions answered. Uh, make sure that you're getting the best possible information that you can. So with that, Ginger, uh, next slide, please. And uh, I've shown this slide uh, every year I've been here uh, and it's only gotten better every year. So. The first, uh, what this shows, if you remember, is annual revenue, less expenses. And uh, if we go back to FY 2013, this is at the university, the system level. Uh, we were generating about $25 million more than we were spending. Uh, if you remember then in 2014, uh, we started overspending our budget uh, by about almost $25 million a year. Uh, that culminated in FY 2017 with a $30 million a year overspend. And just as a reminder, uh, there was no one single entity or one single initiative that was responsible for this. This was athletics. This was a lot of colleges and academic units and campuses and uh, just about everybody. What we did in 2017 is put in place a program to reduce those expenditures. And if you remember in 2018, our goal was to reduce it by 10 to a $20 million over expenditure. By 2019, have it a $10 million over expenditure and then by FY 2020 be balanced and back in the black, if you will. Um, everybody rolled up their sleeves. Our leadership worked really hard. You all as faculty and staff worked on this really hard. Uh, and then FY 2018, instead of a $20 million overspend, uh, we were right about a little less than 8 million. By 2019, we actually generated uh, more money than we spent for the first time in five fiscal years. 
Uh, and then I'm really pleased that by 2020, uh, we actually uh, uh, came out with about a $28 million uh, surplus. Now, if you come in the president's office and you start looking under my desk and going, where's the money? I got some great ideas. You know, We need to invest in faculty salaries and all these other things. Where these dollars are is largely out at colleges and campuses. There's a little bit of this central, but most of it uh, is really in the units that generated it. And this um, surplus also meant that we were able to manage the budget challenges this year from the state by allowing colleges and units, if they so choose, uh, to, to use some percentage of their reserve funds to help us out uh, in this year and mitigate some of the, those uh, cuts. But uh, the bottom line here, this is a really positive news. We're gonna continue to show this each year. I want people to understand uh, the decisions we're making fiscally and, and where we are. And uh, as you have questions about any of this, we'll always be happy to provide those answers to you uh, moving forward. I also will say that I know the last several years have been difficult. Uh, we haven't hired as many colleagues as we wanted and things like that. But you can imagine if we had not taken care of this, and I say we in a collective sense, and you look at 2017 and we had to do a $50 million cut on top of a $30 million annual overspend, we're talking a much different situation than we're in today. So thank you for your efforts uh, in this regard. Next slide. So now we wanna shift in the last portion is a little bit of on strategic planning and some new initiatives. And Elizabeth and I will bounce back and forth here to different slides. So next slide, please. Uh, system plan implementation, doing a plan is one thing, uh, implementing it is another. And there's some key things here uh, that I think are worth mentioning. Um, campus strategic plans, and we have a lot of them and some are being developed, are gonna support and be aligned with a system strategic plan. Uh, that's really an important part. The other thing that uh, I will say is uh, there's an adage, right? If you want to know the priorities of an organization, look where they spend their money. Um, so if you say, how is budget tied in with planning? Uh, my argument is largely for many years here, there was no real relationship between those two things. And that's one of the things that we want to change moving forward. Elizabeth will be co-chairing along with Stacy Pearson an executive budget committee. It'll have faculty representation and others on there, uh, not just to decide annual budgets. It's to look at redoing the way we do budgeting uh, at WSU. And this is not a two week kind of process. This needs to be something that is carefully thought through. Uh, and budget decisions should be tied to the strategic plan. And if that's the case, then people will take the plan seriously because they know it's actually utilized for decision making. If we go back to saying, well, we got this plan here, we'll check boxes off, but we're gonna spend the money the way Kirk as president decides he wants to, that will mean that it's not an effective planning environment for us. And I'm really dedicated to making sure that that makes sense, that plan and budget are tied closely, and that we're using this as a decision-making tool uh, for us as a system. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth now. Well, anthropologists like bar charts too. Um, so uh, with this, I did want to give you an update our enrollment, uh, since many of you have been asking. First of all, um, this is um, this chart here is, is preliminary on official data, um, but I just saw the final data yesterday and it's pretty much the same. Um, System-wide enrollment is down slightly, but less than 2% from the all-time record last semester, uh, sorry, last fall. Um, also, our ethnic diversity and our percentage of first generation students, it also remains about the same, as you can see there, just about 32%. Um, and enrollment on the Pullman campus will be down about 1,100 students to 19,800, um, in part because of, uh, of a large number of freshman deferrals to spring or to next fall. WSU Health Sciences campus has the largest enrollment in its history of 1,730 students. And uh, unsurprisingly, the global campus saw the largest increase enrolling a record of just over 4,000 students, up nearly 750 students from fall 2019. Um, I also did want to mention the, you know, really speaking of strategic initiatives that enrollment management is something that's really 
um, important for the whole system and we are in the process of hiring a vice provost for enrollment management um, and we're bringing in the finalists in the next couple of weeks and hopefully we'll have a successfully concluded search uh, by October. Um, so stay tuned for that. There will be ways to engage in the in the search process when we bring the finalists. So now back to Kirk for next slide. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to continue to be a, a real central tenet of what we're doing at WSU. And I think the uh, issues around uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, a lot of the racial injustice and racism that we saw uh, particularly highlighted this summer, uh, I think I want to uh, make sure I remind everybody that we've been working as an institution on many, many of these items for a long period of time. In 2017, in the fall, we had faculty, staff, and students that really didn't feel that the administration leadership was responding appropriately to some of the needs uh, for our campus community, particularly in Pullman, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. What came out of that uh, was five different working groups. And those working groups started work in 2017, and they've continued over the last couple of years to do outstanding work uh, to put forward some new ideas, new initiatives, and things like that, uh, that we have actually implemented almost all of those things. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of Vice President for Student Affairs, Mary Jo Gonzalez, Associate Vice President Jamie Nolan, uh, and working on those working groups and continuing to move that ahead. Um, the, the natural outgrowth of those working groups uh, is a President's Commission on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we hope to have an announcement out uh, later this month about what that group will look like, uh, what their goals and objectives are, and uh, we're continuing down that journey. Uh, Elizabeth and I right now are doing monthly meetings with the Black Faculty and Staff Association uh, around uh, issues of how do we increase the number of Black faculty and staff at WSU as a system and in Pullman, and how do we make sure that we're doing a better job with, um, uh, with, with not just recruitment, but retention uh, as well. And those have been very positive, but uh, pretty thoughtful discussions. We're diving into some data, uh, and we're going to continue to work hard in this direction. Uh, and then finally, we've got a group uh, chaired by uh, Mel Netzhammer, uh, uh, who is our chancellor at WSU Vancouver, as well as Zoe Hegel strong is director of our native uh, programs here in Pullman, uh, to look at a lot of policies and things that uh, we've had at WSU for 20 or 30 years, but never have looked at them through our equity lens. This is a system-wide initiative. Uh, they've already met once, and this is a long-term project. This is not something that we're going to try and knock out in the next uh, week or two. Uh, and it's going to be important for us to do these long-term systemic reviews that may not feel super sexy at the time, but are really important to making sure that we're encouraging a culture of excellence and uh, equity and inclusion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to talk about some of the new things that she's brought to the table and are doing out of the provost's office. Thank you. Um, so first of all, this fall, WSU will launch a new faculty cluster hire in racism and social inequality in the Americas. And the goal is to seek scholars who will contribute to work in this area and also help to lead institutional transformation at WSU. In recent years, academic institutions have utilized cluster hires to attract and retain a more diverse faculty. And I have done so at my two previous institutions. Cluster hires allow the building of cohorts of scholars who can support and mentor each other, as well as mentor all of us. Uh, and aside from recruiting and retaining a more diverse faculty, when paired with an explicit network-based mentoring program, these kinds of cluster hires can transform the institution through the building of new curricula, research foci, and community engagement. Um, we're also in the process of um, filling the position of Associate Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence. This is a uh, typically has been held by a faculty member and the position has been vacant since May. Um, and I think they were waiting for me to arrive and, and just dot the I's and cross the T's and, and make sure we knew what the priorities were for this position. Um, but that uh, internal search just went out. It'll, it'll be for a 50% time for a current faculty member, associate or full professor. Um, hopefully you've gotten work.
through WSU Insider. Um, and this person is going to uh, be working with myself and with Laura Greiner Hill on issues of faculty hiring, tenure and promotion, research support, um, teaching and mentoring and curricular planning. And also this person will, will help lead the cluster hire initiative as well. Um, clearly this, um, the person holding this position will build on the efforts that, that Kirk has already outlined, uh, the existing diversity, equity and inclusion efforts in Division of Student Affairs, Office of Compliance and Civil Rights, Institutional Research, um, Human Resources and all across um, the, the six uh, campuses in the WSU system. And finally, I did want to touch on, on professional leave. Um, Kirk was mentioning that the Mel and, and Zoe are going to be looking at WSU policies. And, you know, in my own leadership work, I very often look at how, you know, what seemingly innocuous policies and procedures can either impede or augment our ability to support inclusive excellence. And, um, you know, professional leaves are an important opportunity for our tenure stream faculty to advance their scholarship. And um, when I arrived, I learned that in the past, or at least in recent history, there was an unspoken rule that a sabbatical needed to be taken uh, physically distant from one's home institution. Um, and it's clear that making that a condition disadvantages those who have caregiving obligations or economic constraints or whose work actually is tethered to one's home institution. I've only unfortunately had one sabbatical in my entire academic career. Um, and I was doing a, a book project on New England archeology span and my home institution had the world's best uh, archive on New England archeology. span So if I had been forced to go somewhere else, I would have been at a disadvantage. So uh, in the call that just went out for applications for sabbaticals, um, we have made it clear that the physical location of the sabbatical will not be a criteria for evaluating the potential effectiveness of the leave. Um, that's an example where we just need to be uh, making sure that we're supporting um, our faculty, especially during these, these challenging times where, as Kirk mentioned, people are homeschooling children or lacking daycare. We just need to provide the maximum flexibility and understanding as we can. And now back to you, Kirk. Great. So uh, last uh, quick thing, uh, Workday implementation. Uh, this has been a four and a half year project. We started this in 2016 and we expect Workday to be fully up and operational January 1st of 21. Uh, many of you out there may have been involved and engaged with Workday implementation. This has been a massive project and I appreciate that. Originally, we thought it would be July 1 of 20 and it became clear because of COVID-19 and several other things that we just weren't going to be ready. And we thought it was better to delay a little bit of time and make sure that we felt we were as ready as we possibly could be. So in October, there's going to be some university-wide training available, 31 different training courses, 100 step-by-step -step reference guides, 30 video or self-paced learning courses around things uh, uh, Workday. So make sure if Workday is going to be part of what you do, uh, and uh, part of how you operate and, and lead at WSU that you take those opportunities in October uh, when you can. Um, it reminded me back of my, when I was an undergraduate student on something like this, I would have been the guy doing it on December 31st uh, because it was gonna be ready on the first and, and you know, don't do that. Uh, make sure that you have an opportunity to look ahead of time and thank you for everybody involved in that. So with that, uh, Next slide, please. Um, thank you, thank you for all you do. We're happy to answer some questions. There was one question that was submitted in advance that I wanna make sure that I do address and uh, that was around furloughs. Uh, we've had this happen, uh, several people have asked, no furloughs for this year. We've seen that and people have seen that announcement. Uh, what about for the next uh, fiscal year? Well. As I mentioned earlier, we don't know quite where we're going to be fiscally yet. We have to wait for the legislature to meet and see where things are. Uh, one of the other challenges we had with the furlough program this year uh, was that there was going to be some very clear inequities. Uh, there would be furloughs for staff and career track faculty, uh, but not tenure track faculty because of the way the faculty handbook is written. And uh, we just thought, talk about a divisive type of thing uh, to put something like that in place. Uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So 
Uh, if we have to do some sort of furlough program next year, uh, there'll be plenty of announcement, but it'll need to encompass uh, the entire university community. The other thing on any furlough program, it would be graduated. People with the highest earners are gonna have to pay more and uh, in a furlough program, and there has to be a, a basement where you say anybody below a certain amount uh, is not going to see any particular cuts. I don't understand places that have done across the board types of everybody does X percent. Uh, those inequities, we want to make sure that if we have to do something that we do it well. But I want to emphasize to everybody, the bottom line here, I don't want to cut anybody's salary. I'm not interested in doing furloughs if we if we don't absolutely have to. To me, that's a that's a last resort. And uh, I, I don't want anybody thinking that somehow that's our favorite tool to use is to cut salaries. Uh, we're gonna continue to work hard in this respect, continue to communicate openly and work with our deans, vice presidents, chancellors, area finance officers on the best solutions we can uh, to deal with our fiscal issues. So with that, um, love to answer any other questions. I've been trying to watch um, both the uh, Q&A uh, as well as the chat. And uh, just want to take this opportunity. If there are any last minute questions, we're happy to try and answer those. Kirk, I'll go ahead and start off with a question I think faculty are interested in. And Elizabeth, I'm sure you have something to say about this as well, based on some of our previous conversations. Faculty are thinking a little bit about spring and um, the potential to be virtual versus face to face. What does that look like at WSU? What are you thinking about right now in terms of that process and when do you expect to have a decision made? Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, obviously, that's a question that's on all of our minds and, um, you know, there are a number of pieces that go into it. From an academic affairs perspective, we're already um, a little bit late for the time where we would be asking for the Pullman campus uh, for course schedulers to be finalizing the spring schedule. So it's a, it's a timely issue. And I did say at the last COVID town hall on Thursday that we would have a decision uh, by mid October. So I committed us publicly. <laughs> so either I'll be in trouble or, or we will make that, that deadline. Um, in terms of what goes into it, um, you know, we want to avoid having faculty uh, put a lot of effort and staff, our course schedulers, putting effort into something that then we turn around very quickly and um, say, oh, never mind, we're going in a new direction. On the other hand, the one thing that, that none of us can rely on right now is certainty. And so almost no plan that we make by mid-October is going to be perfect based on whatever the context will be in January or February 2021. So we're going to make our best plan that we can by mid-October so that people have as much time to plan for spring knowing that um, things could change. Um, so a couple of things. One, I think it is safe to say that we will not um, have a completely quote, back to normal, 100% face-to-face spring semester. That we, I, I personally think that's safe to say that. So the question really is, it's not a switch, we're remote, we're not remote, because we have some face-to-face -face classes now. We have face-to-face -face activities. We have students on campus, we have students off campus. So the question really is more of a sliding scale. How much more open than right now can we get to? And that is going to involve, I know that the, the Faculty Senate is working with institutional research right now on a survey to faculty just to see how it's been going this semester, like we asked them in spring. And one of the questions includes their recommendations for spring 2021. There's another similar uh, survey going out again from Faculty Senate and IR to students to ask them the same question. Uh, just hearing how things are going this semester will be very helpful. And then of course, our testing and uh, contact tracing and attestation, that's been really, I mean, that just, you know, was developed over the past week or two. It's been amazingly successful. That will provide us with solid information as to what we could possibly stand up for spring, which will be a very important component of this. Um, and then finally, all of the both financial and logistical challenges of student housing um, and a lot of the student activities and fees. Those will all go into a decision making and we'll, we'll try to get that out just as soon as we possibly can. 
Bruce, I, I see also Sarah asked a question uh, about University of Town seeing high numbers of COVID cases uh, among the student population return to Pullman. What more can be done to improve community relations with our Pullman residents? Um, I think this is a great question. Um, you know, we've worked really, really hard. I've worked hard to build up really good relationships with our city council, um, the mayor, local businesses, things like that. Uh, that's taken a bit of a beating uh, over the last month, uh, no question, because I know local residents are upset, uh, as I would probably be about increasing numbers of COVID-19 uh, positives in our community. Uh, we had a lot of students come back that probably I don't know that we anticipated would decide to return. That Whether that happened or not is immaterial, right? They're here and we're glad to have them in our community. But that also meant those off-campus type of events are where we saw a lot of early COVID spread and positive tests. Um, so far, uh, we've been very fortunate and our public health officials outside the university are tracking this. Um, it's largely uh, uh, the infections are uh, the transmission has been between our students and it hasn't really branched out into the community. Um, we have seen a decrease uh, in the number of positive COVID-19 tests, uh, positives over the last week. And one of the things, if we look back and we're gonna start reporting more weekly data, I mean, you'll still get it daily, but the problem is you can have 58 one day, three the next, and then after a while you sort of lose track of is it a good or bad thing. If we sort of look over the last several weeks, um, we had this lowest week we've had yet uh, for about the last month this last week, and we are seeing a, a decrease. Um, and that's despite us increasing by a factor of three or four, the number of people taking tests. So that's a really positive. The other thing I ask people to remember, and we're gonna again communicate in the community a little bit more about this. You say, wow, there's a thousand positives. People forget that doesn't mean there's a thousand people running around that right now uh, have COVID-19 and are communicating that. If we actually start, we're gonna start reporting the number we, we consider active cases in our community, which might be 130. And that's still a lot, but you know, if we just look at that single cumulative number, it can get depressing and discouraging. So we're gonna to continue to communicate with the community. I probably talk to the mayor three or four times a week with SEL uh, about as frequently uh, with others. And we're just gonna to have to keep moving through this. The final thing I wanna say on this is we're gonna get it down, but you know what? It can spike back up in a heartbeat in a weekend with a bunch of people getting together. And so while people feel the moment today to say, I wanted to get it down and feel safer, uh, this is gonna be an issue for us the entire academic year is constant communication, a constant campaign, and a constant reminder to our students, faculty, and staff that this is a really important community uh, set of things we have to do. If any of you have suggestions about ways we can communicate more effectively, things that we could or should do, or things that you're hearing from colleagues at other institutions, please pass it along. I have plenty of people giving me suggestions uh, about things that we need to do, and I reply back to everyone, and I appreciate it. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out, and if you want to be critical and, and things like that, that's okay too. Um, but let us know what you're thinking and, and ideas that you have, because we need the best and brightest to come together to help us do this. And I don't see anything else. So the last thing I want to mention is, uh, as faculty and staff, uh, you always wonder, uh, is Bruce and his team doing a great job of, of uh, managing up and uh, representing Murrow College issues and needs for resources? And you all should have confidence. Bruce does a great job and his team does a great job of bringing forward things that are important uh, to you all as faculty, staff, and students in Murrow College. And so I appreciate his leadership, the positive energy I always feel in Murrow, and some of the changes that you all continue to make administratively, uh, and the new colleagues that we have, uh, I think are exciting, and I look forward to a really bright future. So thanks for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Look forward to hearing from you if you have other comments. Go Cougs. Thank you, Kirk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth.